Uh, so today we are in the last week of the book of Proverbs, and uh, this is week six. Proverbs has been a whole lot of fun, and we saved the funnest for last. And no, that was not grammatically correct, but we saved the best for last. Um, pride. We're going to talk about pride today. Pride. Pride is the absolute worst thing possible to preach on, and here's why. Because nobody thinks they're proud. Nobody sees themselves in this topic and we're going to hear later, this is um, it's a bit of an, in, an invisible problem in our lives. And we're going to explore that idea. Pride, pride, pride. But the reason we're saving this for last is because pride is the foundation of everything else that's going wrong in our lives. It's the primary way that we're bound up and we need to get set free. So today's title is Get Free from Pride. Because it's not about just diagnosing us. It's not just about beating us down. It's about like, how do I get into a better place on this, God? So first we have to hear the truth. And we're going to start with a story just so that I can distract you, right? And like come out the back way and and, um, uh, hit you with some truth. Here's the story. Esther, say Esther. We're looking at the book of Esther today, and we're going we're gonna to pull a story out of that, and, and uh, it's going to be a lot of fun. So Esther, and she has an uncle, Mordecai. Say Mordecai. Mordecai. Um, so Esther and Mordecai. So the book of Esther is about Esther and Mordecai. Here's what's happening. In 400 BC, God's people have been conquered, and they've been taken into exile into the Persian Empire in 400 BC. The Persian Empire is the largest empire that had ever existed up to that point in human history. They were massive, the Persian Empire. And the king was King Xerxes. And so God's people, the Jews, part of them, they are in the Persian Empire, in exile. They're in a hostile culture. This is not their culture. They're just existing there. And one of the leaders of the Jewish people is Mordecai. He's a Jewish leader. And here's what happens. I'm going to give you three scenes in this story. Scene number one is Mordecai's walking along one day, this ancient road. And I don't know, I imagine like a dark alley or something like that. And he's walking by and there's these two guys and they're two of the king's guards and they're sitting there and they're talking and he overhears them. And what they're talking about is they are plotting an assassination attempt of the king. Long story short, he overhears it. He runs to the king's people. He lets them know about the plot. They investigate. They find it's real. They have the two guards killed and the king's life is saved. Awesome. And they write it down in what's called the annals of the king, that on this day, Mordecai saved the king's life, and then the king did nothing else. He had it written in the meeting minutes, essentially, and did not so much as say thank you to Mordecai for saving his life. He must have been busy that day. Have you ever been too busy? You didn't get the thank you card out? That was King Xerxes that day. So that's scene number one, and that's what happened. So scene number two, and this one is all about Haman. Say Haman. Haman. So we got Esther, we got Mordecai, and Esther hasn't even come up in the story, but her name's the name of the book, so we have to say her. Mordecai and Haman. Haman is the king's number two, his right-hand man, this super important official in the empire. And the king decides to give Haman special honor in the empire. And so this is Esther chapter 3, verse 1. Sometime later, King Xerxes promoted Haman, son of Hamadatha the Agagite, over the other nobles, making him the most powerful official in the empire. And all the king's officials would bow down before Haman to show him respect whenever he passed by. For so the king had commanded, but Mordecai refused to bow down or to show him respect. Now, here's what's interesting in this picture. And if we could keep this up for just a second. Here's what's interesting. The king has to issue a decree that says everybody must bow down to Haman. Scholars are confused by this passage, and here's why. Because in the ancient world, anybody who was older than you or anybody who was slightly above you in rank, you would always bow down to them. Some of you are familiar with cultures where it's like there's always a sign of respect and it's built in from a young age in that culture. Here's how you always act. In some cultures, there's a lot of bowing. There's a lot of kissing. There's a lot of hugging. You know what I'm saying? And that was this culture to a whole different degree. They would always bow. So scholars look at this and they're like, why would the king have to come up with a law that says everybody's got to bow to this guy? They should have already been bowing. So do you have ever know anybody 
who really wants to be bowed down to and you really don't want to do it because you sense in them that they're not a respectable person. And then that kind of person, if we're real, aren't they always the very first one that runs off to the boss and says, you got to make everybody. And that's what Haman did. you got to make everybody. And there stands Mordecai. And he senses, nope, this is not a guy that I respect. And he refuses to bow down to him. Do you think that was a good day for Haman? Come on, class. No way. He's ticked. So verse 5, when Haman saw that Mordecai would not bow down or show him respect, he was filled with rage. He had learned of Mordecai's nationality, and so he decided it was not enough to lay hands on Mordecai alone. Instead, he looked for a way to destroy all the Jews throughout the entire Roman or throughout the entire empire of Xerxes. So he's got everybody in the entire empire bowing down to him on a regular basis. There's only one guy that won't. Do you think he overreacts here just a little bit? Because isn't that the way? It's not that respect isn't good. Respect is good. It's when we need respect. This is a picture of pride. It's I need it, and I need it so much, I can't even have one person who would dare not respect me and bow down to me. And so I think I'll do a genocide. Bit of an overreaction, would you say? I think I'll do a genocide. So Haman is going to have Mordecai killed, and he wants to have all the Jewish people killed as well. And I'm not going to resolve the whole genocide question for you today, because that gets handled in other parts of the book. But I would highly recommend your Sunday afternoon, read the book of Esther, because it's super great and super exciting. So here's what happens is, is Haman, this is the little part that you're going to see. Haman decides to kill Mordecai, and specifically the way he does is he has a large pole erected in the courtyard, and it's got a point on it. And he's going to have Mordecai publicly impaled on that pole. So sorry if you have kids in the room with you today. I know this is a little bit violent. But imagine that picture for just a second. Again, bit of an overreaction, would you say? He wants it to be publicly known that this is how you'll die if you don't bow down to me personally. And so this is his plan. And he comes into the king's courtyard one night, Haman does, because he wants to ask the king's permission to have Mordecai killed in this way. And it just so happens that the same exact night, and I say it just so happens, but you know, this is God, right? Like God is always in the coincidences. So the coincidence is the king that very night is having trouble sleeping. Insomnia. And because he can't sleep, He has the guards come in and read him a bedtime story, literally. He says, get the annals of the king, and I want you to read them to me and remind me of some of my greatest hits. Doesn't this sound like a king, right? Like, remind me of all the awesome things that I've done. And so the guards come in, and they start reading to him, probably softly, right, like trying to put him back to sleep. And they're reading along, and they just so happen, God, they just so happen to hit the spot where Mordecai had saved the king's life. And the king stops him, and he's like, oh, I remember that. Wait a second. Did we ever send the thank you card to that guy? And they say, no, king, we didn't. And he's like, okay, well, we ought to do something for that guy. Didn't you say that somebody was out in the courtyard waiting for me? Yeah, it's Haman. So they bring Haman in right in the middle of this discussion. And verse 4, this is Esther 6, verse 4. Who is that in the outer court? The king inquired. As it happened, Haman had just arrived in the outer court of the, police to, of, of the palace to ask the king to impale Mordecai on the pole that he had prepared. And so the attendants replied to the king, Haman is out there. Bring him in, the king ordered. So Haman came in, and the king said, What should I do to honor a man who truly pleases me? And Haman thought to himself, Whom would the king wish to honor more than me? So he falls right into the trap. He doesn't know it's a trap. The king doesn't know it's a trap. God knows it's a trap. But isn't this pride again? Like, I think I'm so awesome. Surely this must be that he's asking about me. So so Haman creates the best thank you honoring scenario he can possibly think of because he thinks it's for him. Whom would the king wish to honor more than me? So he replied, if the king wishes to honor someone, he should bring out of one of the king's own royal, he should bring out one of the king's own royal robes as well as a horse that the king himself has ridden, ridden, and one with a royal emblem on its head. And so he's saying, bring out robes, not any robes. Bring out robes that the king has worn already. People have already seen him in this style. 
They will associate me with the king. What an honor to wear robes he's already worn and put me on a horse that he's already ridden. This is amazing in the ancient world. Let the robes and the horse be handed over to the one of the king's most noble officials. Now, this is not the person being thanked. This is the person who's going to honor him. And let him see that the man who the king wishes to honor is dressed in the king's robes, led through the city square on the king's horse, and have the officials shout as they go, this is what the king does for somebody that he wishes to honor. Some of you are catching up. Verse 10, excellent, the king said to Haman. Quick, take the robes and my horse and do just as you have said for Mordecai the Jew who sits at the gate of the palace and leave out nothing that you have suggested. And so Haman took the robes and put them on Mordecai, placed him on the king's own horse and led him through the city square. What kind of a day was that for Haman? He's so furious that the guy wouldn't bow and now he's put in a position where he's going to lead Mordecai on a horse in all this honor and he's got to shout to everybody else in the entire city, this is the person being honored by the king. Just, wouldn't that just destroy him? And again, we already know from the way that he's acted, the, the tiny little heart that he's got. We know the bondage that he's in. And isn't it interesting that the person who needs the adoration so much doesn't get it? So let's look at what Proverbs has to say about pride. There's different spots in the Bible, by the way, that really give us good stories about somebody out of control in a particular area of weakness. If you want to look at being out of control with lust, go read about King David. Amen? If you want to read about being out of control in um, uh, revenge, read about Samson. If you want to read about being out of control and pride, read Haman. Proverbs tells us what pride leads to. It leads to number one, conflict. Proverbs 13, 10. Where there is strife, there is pride. But wisdom is found in those who take advice. So it leads to conflict. And we, we had a whole week on conflict. But did you know what's underneath conflict is almost always it's pride. It's I have to have my way. I'm the center of attention. Where we go tonight for dinner, it has to be what I say. Do you see the pride there? Not only do I know best, but it's important that I get my way. That's pride. And that leads to arguments. Or if you just want to tell me how I could do better as a spouse, I'm not going to receive that from you. I can't receive that from you. Because that would shatter my little picture of myself. And because of that, my pride keeps us in conflict. Do you see how it's underneath? It's always underneath. Pride leads to blindness next. Proverbs 21, 2. All a man's ways seem right to him, but the Lord weighs the heart. Pride deludes us. Pride makes us think that we're right, and really we're way, way off. Next, pride leads to failure. Proverbs 15, 25. The Lord tears down the house of the proud, but he protects the property of widows. It leads to failure. It leads to all kinds of failure. It led to failure for Haman. Leads to failure. Next, not just failure, but disgrace. Proverbs eleven two. when pride comes, then comes disgrace. But with humility comes wisdom. So what's disgrace? Disgrace is failure of your reputation. People will know about you because of your pride. And when it comes crashing down, it's very personal. Pride leads to opposition from God, Proverbs 16, 5. Everyone who is arrogant in heart is an abomination to the Lord. Be assured he will not go unpunished. That's a big word, isn't it? Abomination. Now, a lot of the verses that I give to you guys on a Sunday morning is from the New Living Translation, which is a very modern translation. But there are other translations that are much more literal and much more close to the original um, uh, Greek and Hebrew texts that they were translated from. ESV is one of those. So I gave this one, this particular one to you in the ESV because I wanted you to see that word abomination. And the reason I want you to see it is because sometimes religious people throw around the word abomination for certain sins as if these things are just this massive thing. What it means is that God has cursed this particular thing. God is against this particular thing. This particular thing will bring consequence. That's what abomination means. And if, of all the sins that abomination can be attached to, how about pride? Pride. God is against it, and you'll see more about that later. 
Pride then leads to total destruction. Proverbs 16, 18. Pride goes before destruction, a haughty spirit before a fall. You guys grew up as kids hearing that phrase, pride goes before a fall. We hear it a lot. It comes from this verse right here. Pride goes before that total destruction in a person's life. It's a person like Haman who is so bound up and they're so blind and they're, they're causing so much trouble for other people, but ultimately for themselves that they experience destruction. Now, what's the flip? The flip of that all is humility. So here's a verse from Proverbs. Humility leads to both wisdom and honor. Fear of the Lord teaches wisdom. Humility precedes honor, Proverbs 15, 33. Fear of the Lord, we've been talking about that several weeks now. Fear of the Lord does not mean I'm scared of God. That's not the biblical way of describing that. What it means by fear of the Lord is I stand in awe of him. I'm so blown away, just like, just like being on the edge of the Grand Canyon. I'm so blown away by how humongous he is, how beautiful he is, how perfect and holy and loving and merciful God is, that I know he's God and I'm not. I know my position. I know how I compare. And having that comparison down is fundamentally good for my human soul. Amen? Amen. And it's good for you. And it's the beginning of your humility. Contrary to Haman, you know who you are. And you know how important it is. You're going to experience slights in this life. But do you need to be respected? That kind of focus on self will destroy you. Fear of the Lord teaches you wisdom and leads to your honor instead. So let's define what the Bible says about pride. Because sometimes in our in our minds, we hear the word pride, and we think synonyms in our mind. We think that sometimes pride is just haughtiness, or pride is arrogance, or pride is a big ego, and things like that. What I'm going to recommend to you is that pride means a relentless focus on yourself, a sleepless, unsmiling, unhappy focus on myself. I have to be number one. That's pride. I have to be the most important person in the room at all times. That's pride. I might even have a low self-esteem, but I still need to be the focus of attention at all times. That's pride. And we got to define this biblically because sometimes we get confused with this word. We've talked about this before. There are some words in the Bible that have a lot of different meanings in our modern day life. We love Doritos and we love our spouse, right? So it's two different kinds of loves. Pride is the same way. The Bible says pride is an abomination. But when your son hits a home run in Little League and you say you're proud of him, that's not an abomination to the Lord, right? That's you affirming him. That's you feeling admiration for a job well done. Those are all really, really good things, really positive things. You should do those things. Your spouse gets an advanced degree in college and like it's graduation day. You're like, I'm proud of you. That's not bad. It's the relentless focus on ourselves that's actually hurting us. So let's go a little bit deeper. This one is Philippians 2 verse 3. Pride means I'm the most significant. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Super helpful verse to understand pride. Look at how it juxtaposes these two things. On one hand, I've got selfish ambition, which means I've got plans, I've got agenda. It's all about me accomplishing things for me. The other thing is I've got conceit, which means my estimation of myself, my worth, and my abilities is higher than it ought to be. That's conceit. So he's saying, instead of having this, instead, consider other people more significant than yourself. Why is that important? Because he doesn't say, consider other people more pretty than you. He doesn't say consider that other people are smarter or more holy or more loving than you. That's not it. It's consider that they're more significant in the room that you make them more important. You want to combat pride? Stop believing and insisting that you're the most important person. That's what it's about. Here's the next verse. Romans 12, 3. 
It says, for the, by, by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought. So here we're back to conceit again for a second. But rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the faith that God has distributed to each of you. So sometimes we're conceited. We think more highly of ourselves than we should. We shouldn't do that. But what does he juxtapose it to? He says, the solution is not to think low of yourself. It's to think of yourself with sober judgment. Jesus would say, make the right judgment. So if you're a singer, let's say, in the audience today, and let's say that sometimes you sing with our worship team on the stage, and somebody comes up to you and they say, hey, do you have a good singing voice? Some of us were taught as kids in the church that we should say, no, I'm a really terrible singer. That's not humility. Humility is knowing who you actually are according to the grace that God and according to the faith that God poured out on you. Sober judgment, not low judgment, but sober judgment. Just to know the truth of who you are. That it's okay to say, I actually can sing, I can carry a tune, do a pretty good job, and they have me on stage sometimes with a worship team. Like that's a good response. But some of us have been mis mistaught this. And, and, and the, the reason that this hurts us is because when we think it's all about being low, we won't see the self-focus that we have when we have a low self-esteem. And we won't understand that God will never ask us to aim towards something that's untrue. Because back to the person with a good voice, you know you're speaking a lie, right? And God would never call you to speak a lie. Just speak the truth. The point of pride is that you would not allow yourself to be the most significant person in the room. The focus doesn't have to be about you, and you have sober judgment about yourself, a right judgment about yourself. Pride can take two forms, an inferiority form and a superiority form. And most of us, when we think of pride, we think of the superiority. And I know this sounds like college class, but I'm going to get through this really fast. I promise. Superiority. This is the part that Haman had, right? This is his out-of-control pride. He has a very inflated ego. And so his self-esteem is he thinks so highly of himself, it's, it's inflated, it's overestimated, ego out of control. What does Haman need? He needs always in every room to be higher than everybody else in the room. And if he's not higher, he's mad about it. He's touchy. Somebody say touchy. He's touchy. That's the superiority pride. It's touchy pride. His drive is always to achieve more and it's always to compete more because there's more accolades at the end. It's not about achieving something that is good in and of itself. It's about competing against others and being compared as higher than them, higher than they are. And because of that, we will push other people down so that we can feel superior. So we do this in personal ways like um, what kind of house do you live in? What kind of car do you drive? What kind of educational level did you need to achieve? What kind of title did you need to achieve at work? What kind of person did you need to marry? For many of us, we didn't necessarily, if we're honest with ourselves, start out with like, these are the things that I want. What we said is, I want to be better than the previous generation before me. I want to do better than mom and dad did. Definitely want to do better than grandma and grandpa did. Why do I have a good house? Because my house is bigger than theirs was. And I know this isn't all of us necessarily, but if you're really honest with yourself and, and you see some of the things that God has given you and you feel satisfaction about that, ask yourself, how does it compare to the generation that came before you? And do you get satisfaction out of the fact that it's better? That it's better. And do you need to compete in that way? We'll push other people down in order to feel superior, this is also where racism comes from. This is where ageism comes from and sexism comes from. It's from a superiority pride that says, I have to be better. I already feel like I kind of am better, but man, I've got to protect my position. King of the mountain stuff, right? And how about pleasure? Do I get to enjoy a promotion for the promotion's sake? Or do I only enjoy it because it's higher than all my other friends? 
Do I enjoy what I make in the neighborhood that, that I live in? Or do I enjoy the fact that I did better than everybody I graduated high school with and I really look forward to reunions? <laughs> and then misery. Because I'm bound with superiority pride like Haman, I will never have peace or real joy in anything for itself because I'm always chasing the next thing and I'm always looking behind my shoulder to see who's coming after me. Superiority pride. What about inferiority pride? Here's the way this one works. Self-esteem is that I look, think too low of myself. I fear that I have no worth and I fear that I'm incapable of succeeding. Fear drives a lot of what I've got in my life. What's my need? My need is for that people would constantly notice me and build me up. And if I'm in the room and other people walk into to the room, I always assume that they have more self-concept than I do. And so if they are just and good Christians, they will always focus on me and build me up. I have a right to it because I'm poor and beaten down. That's the way inferiority pride works. Do you see how, I'm always, how I am still with inferiority relentlessly focused on myself? I'm still the most important person in the room. Even though I feel so beaten down, it's the way that it works. I'm the victim. They should lift me up. Criticism, I can't be criticized if I've got low self-esteem because it'll crush me. I can't handle the idea of growth because I'm so low already. Pleasure, even when I achieve something, I can't get pleasure out of it because I feel like it must be a mistake. For the friends that are in my life, I'm always looking at them and assuming that someday they're going to wake up and leave me because I'm so low. I know this is very personal. And my misery, the bondage that I have, is I'll never have real peace and real joy in a settled heart because my accomplishments don't ever make me feel like what I've done is enough. It's like a black hole in my soul. And no matter, anybody, anybody ever experienced that black hole? I have. And no matter what you throw into it, your accomplishments, it's never enough. It never feels like you can relax and rest and just be settled. No peace. Inferiority pride. C.S. Lewis said this. He wrote a whole chapter in Mere Christianity on pride. Classic chapter. He said, for pride is a spiritual cancer. Pride gets no pleasure out of having something, only out of having more of it than the next man. We say that people are proud of being rich or clever or good looking, but they're not. They're proud of being richer and clever and better looking than other people. It's the comparison that makes you proud, the pleasure of being above the rest. So true humility, it's not thinking less of yourself. It's thinking about yourself less. There was a guy, went to church here, and... Uh, Amazing guy named Michael, and some of you guys knew Michael, know Michael, and, and, and they left to Arkansas uh, not too long ago. And, and if you're ever in a conversation with Michael, one of the things that you notice is you could talk to him for an hour. And he was a talker, and I'm a talker, by the way, so it could go an hour. Um, but we're, we, we'd be talking, and after the conversation was done, here's what you would always notice with Michael is you never talked about you the whole time. Or no, I'm sorry, you never talked about him the whole time. God, I'm just having a day. Um, you never talked about him the whole time. You always talked about you. Because he'd only ask you questions. He'd only ask me questions about me. And so I'd end up answering all his questions, talk the whole time, and get to the end of it. And I'm like, I don't even know what kind of week he had. And it's very sneaky. And afterward, I'd be like, the next conversation I have with Michael, I'm going to ask him questions about him, darn it. He's not going to get me again. And that's the way it would always go. Why? Because he's naturally not focused on himself. I don't think he's trying to do it. I just think he's doing it. I just think he's free. He walks into a conversation and he's focused on you and he's just ready to give. And when you do that, and when that becomes like the main thread of your life and the pattern of your life, I'm just always giving to other people. I'm walking into a room and saying, who needs something? Not walking into the room and saying, who can I connect with? What needs of mine can I get met? So that's a focus on you whether you're superior or inferior. It's all the same thing. Michael just had this way, and he would always make you feel important because true humility is not thinking of less of yourself. It's thinking of yourself less. 1 Peter 5.5 5 says, Young men, 
In the same way, be submissive to those who are older. And all of you, clothe yourselves with humility toward one another because God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. That's kind of like abomination. Do you hear that? Like God opposes the proud. Adam Clark, theologian, says that, that, that verse that, that says God opposes the proud, the words mean that God sets himself, sets himself in battle array against you. It's a formation against you when you're proud. I thought God was loving. Why would God do that? Why would he set himself against me? And that verse, by the way, that is, that is quoted and re-quoted all throughout the Old and New Testaments shows up again and again that God, God puts himself in battle array against the proud, but he lifts up the humble. Why would God do that? I'd put it this way to you. If someone you love is running toward a cliff, where's the most loving place to stand? In between them and the cliff. In battle array against. Stop. This is how seriously God takes this. What does it mean it's an abomination to God? It means he stands against the pride in your life just this deeply. That's how big of a deal it is to him. 1 Corinthians 13, 4, love is patient and love is kind. And this is the classic chapter on love in the scripture where it just describes all about what love is, good love is. It does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud. You can't have pride and love at the same time. That makes sense to us, doesn't it? You can't be there in a conversation with multiple people and be relentlessly focused on yourself and be loving at the same time. Pride is in the way of love. How can, how can you be full of pride in the ways that I've described it to you and still be truly loving to your kids? You can't. How can you be in a conversation with your spouse where you're having a disagreement and be full of pride about it and still work through that disagreement with your spouse? You won't hear their criticism. You can't hear their criticism. It'll either crush you or it will knock you down from your lofty position and you can't have either. And so you can't be teachable. You can't hear correction. That's what pride does to you. Do you see how pride is the cancer that's in front of all the other things? It's the theologians for years, back to, back to, uh, to Augustine, like 200 AD, have been talking about the fact that pride is the sin that's underneath all the other sins. It's the poison that's underneath every other poison in your life is this place of pride. Like, I have to be the center at all times. How can I give to the poor if that money was meant for me to lift me up, to keep my life going the way that it is? When I was in high school, I was super insecure super insecure. I don't know if you met a person as insecure as I was, and I'm not trying to embellish. I was just very, very unhealthy place, and I did not have much in the way of friendships, and I was very uncomfortable around people, and felt very judged, and felt very isolated, and, and, and a lot of this stuff about the insecure form of pride that I'm diving into, I'm describing to you what that part of my life was like. And I did. I, I, I would walk into a room and I'm like, the Christians ought to lift me up. They ought to come after me. You ever judge and be cruel toward wealthy people because you're poor and you think they ought to give you their money? Such a weird Christian thing we do. But it's our insecurity and our self-focus together that's this massive cocktail makes us do weird things. And I was, and I'd, I'd like walk the halls and not know people and, and not have anybody to go and hang out with on the weekend and all, that, all this dumb stuff, but it was just the world to me. And, and we lived about four blocks away from the high school. And I remember walking home um, after school was over and on my way home, I would like, I would say, you know, tomorrow I'm going to be a popular guy. Like I'm going to change it. Like I'm going to wake up. It's going to be different. I'm going to do the things. I'm going to make it happen. And I never did. And I never knew how to make that happen. I was just absolutely miserable on the inside. Again, it's like I was broken down, but I was so focused on myself. And then Jesus came along and saved me. And I've got my whole salvation story, I'll tell you sometime. But, but when I got saved, I was at 18, and I went off to college after that. And, and, and when I got saved, it was just this massive thing for me because I was radically saved, and I was annoyingly saved. Do you know any annoyingly saved people? 
they're in that honeymoon phase of knowing Jesus and they're so excited about their faith and they're just nonstop talking to you about it and pumped. And that's the way that I was, just so pumped. And, and, and the reason was is because I knew the way that I had sinned and I knew that I, I deserved hell and that God was giving me heaven instead by his grace. And it all just made sense to me. I can't explain it any other way. It just made sense. And so I was just absolutely thrilled. And, but the other thing that started to happen is I started to notice it was like a raw nerve in my life. Everything that I did was motivated by pride. And I would say that to people at the time. Brand new Christian, but I'm like, I'm such a proud guy. I'm such an ego-driven guy. I can't believe it. Every, every conversation I would have, I'm like, I formed my words in order to impress those people. I didn't have an authentic conversation with them. And the way that I walked into the room, I'm trying to posture myself. I'm trying to act in a certain way. Not an authentic version of myself. I'm trying to be a certain version of myself that will be above them. And I was constantly doing it. And I just felt it all the time. It was driving me crazy. And people would say, hey, Josh, why don't you pray and, and open up this meeting in prayer? And I'm like, I can't. Because I'll keep making speeches to God to impress all of you. I don't know how to say an authentic prayer. I just, I'm so stuck in pride and I'd pray every night and I made a commitment to God for an entire year. I'm like, I'm gonna pray every single night, God, that you would destroy pride within me because I'm absolutely out of control. And I prayed that for a year. And God eventually came back to me and said, this issue that you're wrestling with, I am going to slowly burn it out of you between now and heaven. Let me do it. It's not the time frame that I wanted, but okay. Another thing that was going on at the exact same time, and this relates, some of you guys have heard me tell this story, but I, I never understood the importance of it until this, this particular message. But also through that, through that year, there were lots of different cafeterias at ISU, and I would go to different ones. And I made this commitment early on. I said, I'm never going to sit with anybody that I know Anybody that I've ever met, I'm always going to find somebody that's sitting alone, and I'm going to go to that table. I'm going to introduce myself, and I'm going to push past the awkwardness of it, and I'm just going to act like a, a news reporter and just start asking them questions about their life, and I'm going to find out everything that I can possibly find out about them. You know how easy of a conversation that actually is to have with somebody when you just make it all about them? It's pretty easy. And so I would do that, and I'd meet people, and some of them were awkward, and it was okay. We just got past it. But what slowly started to happen to me over that year is that I stopped being so shy, as you can imagine. And I started making a whole lot of friends in that place. And, and, and the more some of that low self-esteem started to burn out of me, I started to realize <laughs> um, I'm not so focused on myself all the time because I'm focusing on them. Do you see it? I this. I had this dumb little idea. I was going to help people. Do you know who I was helping? Me. I was getting every single conversation I had was setting me free from myself. Are you exhausted today? Because you're so bound up in you. If this makes sense to you, I'm talking to you right now. Are you exhausted today? Because you've lived an entire life that's about your sensitivity. Get free of you. We need to get free of us. Matthew 16, 25, Jesus said, whoever tries to save his life will lose it, and whoever loses himself for my sake or the gospel will find his life. Finally, the word finally isn't in there. I just added it, but you know what I'm saying. <sighs> lose your life in every conversation. Lay it down. Timothy Keller said, pride is the carbon monoxide of sin. It silently and slowly kills you without you even knowing. It's so hidden. Do you hate snobs? Do you hate snobbish people? Do you look down your nose on people who look down their nose at other people? Yes? We're full of pride. Here's another test. Um, we read the Bible and we say, that's not how I would have said that, God. I wouldn't have included that in the story. I wouldn't make the doctrine this. God, I wouldn't say this. Don't you know our culture, God? 
Don't you know, God, that our modern culture has reached the epicenter of moral wisdom and you no longer compel, compare well to our modern culture? Don't you know that, God? Pride. How many of you have listened to this entire sermon so far, as long as it is, and thought, man, I really have a couple people that need to hear this. <laughs> I'll give you a little longer on that. You ever sleep in the wrong car? You ever sleep wrong in the wrong car? When I was young, I could, we, we could take long car rides, and I could sleep in the seats of the car hours at a time and feel fine at the end, right? Because at the time, our cartilage and bones are made of gelatin, and we just, you know, we're fine. But the older I get, I can't do that anymore, so I can't sleep on car rides anymore because... The thing is, is it's, it's the car seat against me, and the car seat will win, and I'll be in pain. Come on, where you at, old people? Let's go. <laughs> when you live a life of pride, you are going against the grain of the universe, and you will experience pain, misery for the rest of your life. What the Bible is trying to tell us today is that humility is the flow and it is the way that he has made the universe to operate. It's what he's made you for. And it's the only way to love and to be outside of yourself. And you've got to get free. What I want for you today is freedom. So how do you do it finally? The solution, I'm going to give you four steps that you can take to get better at humility. Number one, relentlessly focus on others. Be a Michael Harding. Say, every conversation I have, every room I walk into, I'm going to serve somebody. I'm going to lay my agendas down, and I'm going to help somebody else out. I'm going to make it about them like they're the star, and I'm not the star. God, help us from being the star every single time. Relentlessly focus on others and see what it does to you every single time you win that. Next, learn to love correction because every single time you get corrected, it's a chance to repent. It's a chance to grow. It's a chance to say, I'm not God. He's God. I'm the one that needs to change. And every single time you can do that, you win. You grow. You change. You improve. Amen. I just got to grow. Number three, love the limitations that God gives me. Love those things. Do you wear glasses today? Do you love God for your glasses? Do you have allergies today? I mean, I love Claritin, but I love the limitations that God has given me. Do you have an anger problem today? Can you love the limitations in the way that Jesus is going to be shown through your life, not through your perfection? And can you welcome the criticism that's going to come into your life as a result? Can you love your limitations? St. Paul did this. He said, I've got a thorn in my side. I've got a thing I'm unhappy about. I asked God to take the thing away. And he said, no, my grace is made perfect in your weakness. People see more of Jesus than more of you. Amen? Could I learn to love the limitations that God gives me because that means I need him more? And then number four, could I refuse to feast on the praise of people? And only feast on God. Back to Haman. And this is the last thing I promise. Haman. The problem with Haman. He didn't want the wrong thing at the end. He was just looking at the wrong king. And I know that rhymed. He was looking at the wrong king. It's not that we shouldn't look for affirmation and praise. It's that we've got to stop looking for it from people. Looking for praise ultimately from God is the right thing. Why? Because he's a safe person to worship. Jesus comes to the end of the, the, the parable of the sower and, and says, well done, good and faithful servant. Right? Like, 
That should get your heart going. I can't wait for that day when God says, you raised your kids like this. You lived your life like this. You did this with your resources. Well done, good and faithful servant. That, oh, the praise of heaven. And that's a thing to look forward to. And that's not pride. Because every other human affirmation will twist me into the image of what I'm looking toward. But when I aim for his praise, I get twisted into his image, and that's a good twisting. Matthew 25, we sang about this earlier, says the king will say to those on his right, come you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the creation of the world. For I was hungry and you fed me. I was thirsty and you gave me a drink. I was a stranger and you invited me into your home. Oh, that God would set you free from the relentless focus on yourself, focused on others, focused on him, that I would please him, that I would have that day of affirmation. That would be success. I redefine it all. Amen? Would you guys stand? Even now, Father, I think many of us are focused on the people that we really wish would hear and understand this message because, man, they would get so healed from it. Our family would be better, so much better. Our marriage would be so much better if only they would listen. Remind us, God, that we are the ones who need to listen. We're the ones who need to be honest. There's a little bit of Haman in every single one of us here. Come and set us free. We can't set ourselves free. Get us started down the path, doing some of these humble things and build humility slowly within us. We love you and we trust you, Jesus. In Christ's name, amen.